This lecture is the third lecture dealing with polysomnography for clinical neurophysiologists. It deals with sleep scoring in special circumstances, including some pathological conditions. The first part of this talk will be conducted in a conversational format, and the second in a question and answer format. I would like to start this section by depicting and talking about elements that define polysomnographic segments. A thin a straight line will be used during this talk to represent a low amplitude mix frequency activity. A three canela colored humps will represent a rhythm characterized by a slow wave of a sleep. White compacted wiggly lines will be used to represent alpha activity or posterior dominant activity or rhythm. A step down line will be used to represent a drop of one hertz in posterior dominant rhythm. A single sharp line will be used to represent vertex waves. Very compacted wiggly lines will be used to indicate high chin EMG tone. A short duration green compacted wiggly line will be used to represent sleep spindles. A bluish sharp wiggly line will represent arousal. An up and down line will be used to indicate slow eye movements. Rapid eye movements will be illustrated by a yellow fast wave. A magenta up and down sharp line will indicate a K complex. The same figure with added bluish sharp wiggly lines will be used to indicate a K complex with arousal. As we previously mentioned, these elements are used to tag segments of an epoch. Those segments will be tagged as W, N1, N2, N3, and REM. These tag segments are then used to score an epoch. The epoch will therefore be scored with the letters W, N1, N2, N3, and REM, or plainly R. Let me give you an example. In this frame, you can see rapid eye movements, which I have depicted as I have illustrated in the prior section. We also see a slow eye movements, high chin EMG, low amplitude mixed frequency activity, and alpha rhythm. So based on the rapid eye movements and the high chin EMG, the segments at the beginning and at the end of the epoch should be scored W. The segment between them, based on the presence of a slow eye movements and low voltage mixed frequency, should be tagged as N1. Since the area occupied by N1 is larger than the area tagged W, the epoch should be scored N1. So, as you can see, an epoch is always scored based on the segment that predominates in it. Segments are tagged 
and predominance is granted based on well intended but arbitrary and chaotic rules. Though some elements only tag the epoch they occupy while they while others project their influence, most of these elements, such as a spindle, only influence the record in front of them. But one, rapid eye movements do so backwards and forward. Elements that determine the tagging of a segment based on the area they occupy in the epoch being a score are, that is, elements that do not project are alpha activity. If the area tag alpha activity or rhythm corresponds to more than 50% of the epoch, then the epoch should be scored W. In this frame, you can see a tracing with relatively small amount of alpha rhythm. This alpha activity is above the lines I have just introduced and constitute 10% of the epoch. I have just introduced a second tracing with more alpha activity than the first one. The alpha activity in this case corresponds to 33% of the epoch. Now I have introduced a third tracing with 85% of alpha activity or rhythm and a fourth tracing with 100% of alpha rhythm. In addition to alpha, another element that determines tagging based on its presence is posterior dominant rhythm. This rhythm qualifies for the purpose of scoring as alpha rhythm despite not reaching the frequency of 8 Hz in non-alpha producers, adults, and in children. It follows the same rule as alpha. A slow wave of a sleep, if present in more than 20% of an epoch, defines the epoch. This frame shows a tracing with a small amount of slow wave of a sleep. As you can see, highlighted by the lines that I have just introduced. This activity in this tracing occupies 13% of the epoch. This frame shows a minimal increase in the percentage of a slow sleep waves in a new tracing. Notice that K complexes if more than 75 microvolts and present in the frontal region will count for the tally of a slow wave of a sleep. In this new tracing, the percentage of slow sleep wave is 21.3. This percentage will suffice to score the epoch as stage 3. In this new tracing, about 25% of the epoch is occupied by a slow wave of sleep. Following a slow waves of sleep, Alpha activity in an epoch in which the segment or segment stack body movements occupy more than 50% of it is a special situation. It is a special situation because in such epoch, no matter how small a segment of alpha activity is, the epoch should be scored W. Let's stop for a second before I explain the deal with the body movement and alpha, I will remind you of the rules about a scoring epoch in which the segment or segment stack body movements occupy more than 50% of the epoch, but there is no alpha activity. When faced with an epoch in which body movement occupies more than 50% of it, with no alpha activity anywhere in the epoch, we're going to call these instances or these epochs as non-alpha body movement occupied epochs. 
the first step in these cases is to look at the prior epoch. If the prior epoch is N1, N2, N3, or R, then the epoch in question should be scored as the next epoch. If, on the other hand, the epoch prior to the epoch in question is W, then the epoch in question should be scored W. So let's see how this works. An epoch without any alpha rhythm occupied by major body movement, that is an epoch occupied by artifact for more than 50% of its duration but no alpha activity anywhere, uses a peculiar rule as we have just mentioned. In this frame, I have reconstructed such an epoch to visually explain what I have just told you. So, following the steps in the chart we just presented, for scoring a non-alpha body movement epoch, the first question is regarding the stage of the prior epoch. If preceded by R, the epoch in question should be scored as the next one, that is, as, as the next epoch. So, if the next epoch is N1, then the epoch in question should be scored N1. Now, let's look at a different situation. Here, the epoch in question is preceded by N1 and followed by N2. So, we should label it N2. Here, in another situation, the epoch in question is preceded by N1 and followed by REM. So, we should label it as R, but scoring this epoch as R comes in conflict with the unshakable rule that in physiologic condition, Shin EMG must be low to diagnose REM. Thus, I would choose to label this epoch as N1, but others may label it as W. Neither I or the other would be wrong to do so by making any of these two choices. The second arm of this flowchart addresses the issue of how to score a non-alpha body movement epoch when the prior epoch is W. And the rule states that the epoch in question should be score W. So, in this situation, presented in this frame, the preceding epoch to the epoch in question is W, and the following epoch is N1. So, the epoch in question should be scored as W. In this frame, the preceding epoch to the epoch in question is W, and the following epoch is R. Therefore, the epoch in question should be score W. Now, let's address the issue of body movement and alpha in the same epoch. This is an epoch dominated by body movements with alpha activity at the end of it. The amount of alpha activity or rhythm does not matter, just one second will do. To classify the epoch as a body movement with alpha. Such an epoch, regardless of the preceding or following stages of the prior epochs, should be scored as W. 
So using the same flowchart for alpha body movement epoch, if an alpha body movement epoch is preceded by N1, N2, N3 or REM, the epoch in question should be scored W. If, on the other hand, it is preceded by an epoch labeled W, it should also be scored as W. So, in the presence of any alpha activity in a body movement dominated epoch, as highlighted by the green shadow in the first, second, and third panel, regardless of the preceding or following epoch, the epoch in question should be labeled W. So enough about major body movements epochs. The next element I have listed is the lowest Shin EMG tone recorded abutting a rapid eye movement. The combination of these elements in this order dictates tagging and notice the emphasis on the word tagging the segment so involved as REM. So in this frame the combination of the lowest Shin EMG tone indicated by the parenthesis abutting rapid eye movements warns tagging the segment as R. But since it occupies less than 50% of the epoch, the epoch should not be scored as R, it should be scored based on the tagging of the rest of the segments in the epoch. In this new frame, the lowest Shin EMG tone occupies a wide area and is aborting rapid eye movements. So the segment should be should be tagged REM. And therefore, since the segment tag REM is more than 50% of the epoch, the epoch as a whole should be score REM. After this item concerning the lowest sheen EMG aborting REMs, I will address the last item in this frame. This item has three components. The first component is that Chin EMG tone is not the lowest in the recording. The second component is that this activity abuts rapid eye movements. And the third component is the presence of a low amplitude mixed frequency background. The presence of these components that is this constellation of findings warns tagging the segment as W. In this epoch, the segment consisting of rapid eye movements abuts not the lowest Shin EMG tone that was present during it. In addition, the background activity consists of low amplitude mixed frequency. So this segments should be tagged W. The magenta shaded area consisting of slow eye movements with low amplitude mixed frequency EEG background should be tagged as N1. Since in this case, that is in this epoch, the duration of the W segment is more than the duration of the N1 segment, the epoch should be scored W. 
So going back to the frame with the initial premise, if we look at the tagging recommendations, we can see that we have just finished talking about the tagging of segments of an epoch based on the actual presence of an element in that epoch. Now I will briefly talk about segments being tagged based on influence exerted by different elements on the epoch adjacent to the epoch of question. Any segment not tagged based on the presence of a tagging element in the midst is tagged based on the influence exerted upon the segment by certain elements found in the neighboring epochs. This influence can be exerted for the upcoming epochs. So, in the case as it is with the spindles, a slow eye movements, K complex without arousal, and K complex with arousal. Forward and backward influence is exerted only by one element. Rapid eye movements in the presence of the lowest Shin EMG in the record. So, as you can surmise from prior videos on tagging and scoring epochs, we can come to the conclusion that there are two types of epochs, those that we can call unambiguous and those that we can call ambiguous. An unambiguous epoch is one scored based on the prevalent tag segments in the epoch in question. This is an unambiguous epoch because the segment in front of the spindle is tag N2 and since it constitutes over 50% of the epoch, then the epoch should be labeled or scored N2. This is an unambiguous segment because of the presence of, a, of rapid eye movements and their back and forward influence in the presence of a voting lowest sheen EMG in the tracing. This epoch therefore should be scored REM. This epoch is also an unambiguous epoch. I like to refer to this epoch and others like it as conflicting unambiguous epochs. I like to do so to distinguish them from the two previous situations I just mentioned. Let me elaborate on this. In the two prior situations, there was only one scoring element in the epoch. In this epoch, there are two scoring elements. One is the forward influence of the spindle which will warrant the epoch to be labeled in one fashion but there's another element which is rapid eye movement that has in addition to a forward influence a backward influence and since in this epoch the Shin EMG is low then we should label it as REM. Which indeed is the way that we should score the whole epoch. Let's look at another unambiguous conflicting situation, hopefully it will make it clearer. This is a conflicting unambiguous epoch because rapid eye movements influence the epoch tagging in both directions. 
those the segments influenced by it is slightly more than the segment influenced by the first spindle. The segment in front of the first spindle is not labeled N2 because in the presence of the lowest sheen EMG tone in the tracing, the backward influence of rapid eye movements trumps the forward influence of a spindles or cake complex for that matter. So this epoch should be labeled REM. Let's look at another example. This will be the last example of unambiguous conflicting situations I will show you. This is an unambiguous conflicting epoch because there is a conflict between the backward influence of rapid eye movement in the presence of the lowest shin EMG in the tracing and the forward influencing of the spindle. The same as we saw last time, but there is a big difference. The big difference is that the forward influence of the second spindle is negated by the backwards and forward influence of the rapid eye movements as it happened before. But the forward influence of the first spindle, that is from the beginning of the first spindle to the end of the last spindle is more than 50% of the epoch. Thus, this activity is dominating the, the epoch. And therefore, this epoch should be scored in two. So the rule goes in these situations as follow. The backwards influence of REM is not enough to overcome the influence of two spindles if between them there is more than 50% of the epoch. So now, after having talked about unambiguous epochs, I would like to say a few words about ambiguous epoch. An ambiguous epoch is one that does not have enough elements to be labeled without the help of another epoch. In other words, there are not enough scoring elements that would allow for the epoch to be scored one way or the other. So in this case, this ambiguous epoch will be labeled based on the presence of the spindle in the prior epoch regardless of the labeling of the epoch the spindle is at. It will be labeled N2. This other ambiguous epoch, based on the presence of being followed by a REM epoch after it, will be labeled REM as long as the Shin EMG remains the lowest in the tracing. To conclude this conversational section, I will make some final remarks regarding scoring. Scoring an epoch W is very often guided by findings in the ocular channels. If eyes are open and the patient is behaving awake, is awake. The epoch should also be scored W if blinking at the rate of 1 every 2 seconds or twice per second is present. Also if rapid eye movements with normal or high chin EMG is present or if reading eye movements predominate in the epoch the epochs should be labeled W. Finally, if eyes are closed, but less than 50% of the background EG activity is alpha rhythm or posterior dominant rhythm, the epoch should also be labeled W. Let's look at this epoch for a few 
seconds. In this frame, you see rapid eye movements during most of the epoch, high Shin EMG is also present during the whole epoch, and alpha activity is present intermittently during the whole epoch. So the epoch should be scored W. Now, let's say a few words about scoring N1. The EEG channels will show background changes occurring during a brief period of time. This is called a transitional phase. Such transitions will be from an alpha dominated epoch to an epoch with less than 50% alpha rhythm. From a low amplitude mixed frequency background to a background with a sustained drop in frequency of at least 1 hertz. Or the appearance of hypnagogic hypersynchrony once the background is established, the N1 EEG background consists of a low amplitude mixed frequency in the theta range. N1 sleep harbors two paroxysmal elements vertex waves and posterior occipital sharp transients. N1 sleep does not have spindles or K complexes. The eye channel during N1 is characterized by a slow roving eye movements. Shin EMG tone may be reduced from a stage W, but it will not reach the level that will be present later on during REM sleep. So let's look at this epoch's characteristics. You see that there is alpha rhythm in this epoch, but that it constitutes less than 50% of the epoch. So the prevalent background activity is low amplitude mixed frequency activity of, as we have just previously mentioned. A slow eye movements are present. Shin EMG is relatively low. So in an epoch that has all these characteristics, we should score it in one. Now let's say a few words about N2. The onset of N2 corresponds with the presence of a spindles or gate complex without arousal. The background is low in the theta range. Less than 50% of the epoch should be alpha rhythm and less than 20% of the epoch should be occupied by a slow sleep waves. Paroxysmal elements encountered in N2 are posterior occipital sharp transients, vertex waves, spindles, and K-complex without arousals. So let's look at an N2 epoch. The arrow is pointing to a K-complex bearing no changes in the background activity or the presence of rapid eye movements, arousal or slow eye movements, all the forward activity present in front of the K-complex 
should be tagged in two. So this whole epoch should be scored in two. This is a new epoch. I am showing you this frame to point out to you two things. The first one is that slow wave may be present, but as long as they do not occupy more than 20% of the epoch, the epoch should be scored in two. The second thing I wanted to point out to you is that the EMG may be high during N2. Now let's look at N3. N3 is the last non-REM sleep stage to be arrived at during normal sleep. N3 should be scored when a slow wave of sleep are present in over 20% of the epoch. Paroxysmal elements that may be observed during N3 are post, spindles, K-complex without arousal. Remember, if the slow component of a K-complex is more than 75 microvolts, and it is recorded in the frontal derivations, it should be scored as a slow sleep wave. This epoch corresponds to an entry epoch. Now we will address stage REM. REM sleep usually and normally starts after 70 to 90 minutes of sleep. It is heralded by a drop in muscle tone and once established by the presence of rapid eye movements. The EG background consists of low amplitude theta wave with marked asynchrony, much the same as during awake, with eyes open. Paroxysmal elements during REM are so to waves and in the chin channel transient brief muscle tone elevations which are superimposed on the low sustained muscle tone that is usually present in the chin EMG electrodes. Here you can see an epoch of REM. Rapid eye movements are present sustained shin tone is low as you can see in multiple segments of the recording but also fasic shin tone is present you can see here pointed by the arrow the brief elevation in chin tone that occurs during REM. And they occur with relative frequency at it, as it is being pointed out by the multiple directions of the arrow. Here, here, and here. Such findings coupled with an EEG background as present in this epoch is characteristic of REM stage sleep. So this is the end of the conversational section and we will start with the question and answer section. Please take a look at this tracing and choose the best answer. As you can see, rapid eye movements are present in the eye channels. You can see one at the beginning of the epoch and later on. 
Notice also the presence of spindles. At least twice in this epoch has been pointed out by the arrows. This situation is called REM spindle sleep. That is a situation where spindles occur during REM sleep. REM spindle sleep is present in 1 to 7 percent of normal subjects. REM spindle sleep is more likely to occur when sleep is disturbed many times during polysomnolent recording and also following the first night of continuous positive airway pressure treatment. REM spindle sleep is not more common in children. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Who discovered REM sleep? A. Nathaniel Clayton B. Alan Rich Schaffen C. Anthony Kales D. Eugene Asedinsky The first widely used manual for scoring sleep was written by Alan Rich Schaffen and Anthony Kales. The story of how REM's movements were discovered is very interesting. If you have the time, read it. Here I have just presented the abstract so you can take a look at it if you stop the video for a few seconds. REM sleep was discovered by Eugene Aserinsky. This frame shows a sample of the first REM sleep recording published, as far as I know. The arrows point to the rise time. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Score a respiratory event as periodic breathing if there are episodes of central respiratory pulses lasting 6 seconds separated by 40 seconds of normal breathing. A true, B false. When you are asked a question about breathing patterns, my advice is for you to draw the activity in question and add the normal values that you remember on the different elements as you are drawing them. This frame shows an example of periodic breathing recorded from the nose and chest. Periodic breathing is defined as three or more respiratory pulses, in this instance three, lasting three seconds or more. In this case, they lasted six seconds. These respiratory pulses have to be separated by normal breathing periods lasting less than 20 seconds. In this case, the normal breathing periods lasted about 14 seconds. So the answer to this question is false. There has to be three pauses and the normal breathing element must be less than 20 seconds in order to be qualified as a periodic breathing episode. Next question. An increase of PCO2 of more than 10 millimeters of mercury during a sleep from an awake supine value 
that reaches as high as 45 millimeters of mercury and lasts for more than 10 minutes constitute a hypoventilation. A true, B false. Hypoventilation can be defined as a period of decline more than 10% in hemoglobin saturation without evidence of upper airway obstruction. Hypoventilation during sleep is often defined as a partial CO2 increase of more than 10 millimeters of mercury during sleep in comparison with awake supine values. The duration of this increase has not been clearly determined, but some definitions set 10 minutes as a minimal duration of an episode, causing accumulation of partial CO2 to consider it diagnostic of hypoventilation during sleep. The next question is if PCO2 is more than 55 millimeters of mercury. The number 55 was chosen, I think, because during wakefulness, PCO2 equals or is less than 45 millimeters of mercury. Hence, if we consider an increase of more than 10 as the criteria for hypoventilation, then we get to 55. If the answer is yes, then the patient has hypoventilation. If arterial PCO2 is not 55 or more, the next step would be to ask ourselves if the level is above 50, that is if it is 51, 52, 53, or 54. If the answer is no, then the patient is not likely to have hypoventilation. On the other hand, if the answer is yes, then we have to ask ourselves if this level represents an increase of more than 10 millimeters of mercury from the waking level. If the answer is yes, then we should diagnose hypoventilation. So the answer to this question is false. To diagnose hypercapnia during wakefulness, the PCO2 has to be more than 45 millimeters of mercury, and to diagnose hypercapnia during sleep, it should be more. Next question. Increased inspiratory flattening of the nasal pressure or positive air pressure device flow is a sign of obstructive apnea. A true, B false. The most important respiratory parameters evaluated during polysomnography include oral nasal thermal flow, chest and abdominal movements, nasal pressure, that by determining amplitude reduction and changing contour of the wave identify patients with increased upper airway resistance and noise. Noise is usually detected by using a microphone. A snoring is associated with increased upper airway resistance. These parameters are sufficient in most cases to diagnose apnea and hypoapneas and to determine whether they are central or obstructive. In adults, a drop in peak signal or nasal flow excursion lasting 10 seconds or more by 90% constitute in apnea. If the drop is between 30 and 90 percent and it is linked to a 4 percent drop in PO2, other consider, other consider the drop of 3 percent to be significant 
whichever one we use, such a drop constitute a hypoapnea. Next, in order to determine if the apnea is central, proctor, or mix, you have to ask yourself if there is a snoring. If there is no snoring, then you have to ask yourself if there is increased inspiratory flattening in the tracing corresponding to the nasal pressure or the positive airway pressure device. If the answer is no, then you must ask yourself one last question, and the question is if there is associated thoracoabdominal paradoxical breathing during the event that was not present before the episode. If the answer is no, then we have to conclude that the apnea or the hypoapnea is central. If instead we ask ourselves the question about snoring and the answer is yes, then the respiratory event should be labeled obstructive. If the response to the question whether there is an increased inspiratory flattening of the nasal pressure or an increased positive airway pressure device flow is yes, then we have to conclude that th there is an obstructive apnea. And if the response to paradoxical breathing is yes, then we also have to conclude that we're dealing with respiratory event related to obstruction. This is an example of a hypopnea since the aeronasal airflow has dropped by more than 30% but not more than 90% and it has lasted more than 10 seconds. The O2 saturation has dropped from 97 to 92, which represents a drop of more than 4%. And the hypoamnia meets criteria to be labeled obstructive because of the presence of three parameters. Snoring, flattening of the nasal pressure recording, and the presence of paradoxical breathing during the episode that was not present before or after the episode. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The breath length duration or cycle length must be at least 50 seconds to diagnose Cheyenne stop respirations. A true, B false. Cheyenne stock breathing is a form of periodic breathing characterized by one crescendo and decrescendo pattern of respiratory efforts between central apnea or hypoapnea and two, a long respiratory cycle length. Cheyenne stock's breathing should only be diagnosed polysomnographically in the presence of three or more consecutive cycles of crescendo and decrescendo change in breathing amplitude occurring in conjunction with either periodic breathing lasting longer than 10 minutes or anapnea hypoania index of equal to or more than 5 per hour. So the first step in polysonographically diagnosing Cheyenne stock syndrome or breathing is the detection of central apnea or hypoapnea. Central apnea or hypopneas are polysonographically characterized by a drop in nasal flow or pressure meeting the criteria for apnea or hypopnea. In this case, that is in this frame, you can see absence of snoring, lack of flattening in the nasal airflow pressure channel. I have in this frame 
introduce the pattern corresponding to octropic apnea so you can compare with the one that is happening in this frame when we talk about central apnea. In addition to the two previously mentioned parameters, paradoxical breathing must be absent. In this frame, you can see an arrow pointing to respiratory inductance Fismography flow. This is a derivative by mathematical computation of the respiratory inductance flethysmography sum. The respiratory inductance flethysmography sum is arrived at by adding the abdominal movement that occurred during respiration and the chest movement that occurred during respiration. The respiratory inductance flexismography flow provides a measurement compatible with the end tidal volume. I think of it as indicative of the flow of air in the lungs. The steps to diagnose Cheyenne stock breathing are to ask oneself if central apneas or hypomnias are present. If the answer is yes, then we specifically have to look for the presence of three or more consecutive central apneas or hypomnias separated by a crescendo decrescendo breathing pattern. If this is also present, then the next question is to ask herself if the duration of the breath length or respiratory cycle length is equal to or more than 40 seconds. I think that showing you an example of this point will help. This frame shows the nasal flow pattern of three apneas on top and three hypoapneas in the bottom. The duration of the apnea is 21 seconds. The respiratory phase has a crescendo decrescendo pattern that lasts 59 seconds. So, the breath length duration or cycle respiratory length duration is 80 seconds, measured from the last breath before the apnea to the last breath prior to the next apnea. Breath length duration or breathing cycle length for hypopnea is measured differently than those for apnea. For hypopnea, the breath length duration is measured from the largest breath of one breathing phase to the largest breath of the next breathing phase. In this example, the breath length duration is 80 seconds long. So now I have gone back to the flow chart and the location of the arrow is where we were before I started showing you the example. So I will continue from there. At this point, we must ask one more question. The question is, does the record shows in a two hour period an apnea, hypoapnea index of five or greater? Or does it show periodic breathing for 10 minutes of lo or, or longer? If so, if any of these two requirements are met, then we can make the diagnosis of Cheyenne stock respiration. So the answer to this question is false. It must be at least 40 seconds 
to diagnose Cheyenne stock respirations. Next question. How would you classify this event? A. Apnea, B. Hypopnea, C. Respiratory effort related arousal. In this frame, you can see reduced airflow, but not enough to either meet the criteria of apnea or hypopnea because it is no more than 30%, which is the requirement for the diagnosis of hypopnea. The increased respiratory effort here manifested by flattening of the nasal pressure wave must last 10 seconds or more to consider these findings pathological. And they must also be linked to an arousal. So when we have this situation, a respiratory pause that lasts 10 seconds but does not meet criteria for the diagnosis of hypopnea and is associated with an arousal, we use the term respiratory effort related arousal. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. For patients older than six years, sustained sleep bradycardia refers to a drop in heart rate below 40 beats per minute. A true, B false. Bradycardia is defined as sustained heartbeat of less than 40 beats per minute. The word sustained is not defined in the criteria to diagnose bradycardia. Bradycardia is more likely to occur during non-REM sleep because of increase in parasympathetic tone and sympathetic withdrawal. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which of the following is not true? A. A score bradycardia for heart rate less than 40 beats per minute sustained after 6 years of age. B. Score assistly for cardiac pauses more than 3 seconds after 6 years of age. C. Score tachycardia for heart rate more than 90 beats per minute sustained for adults. D. Atrial fibrillation cannot be detected by polysomnography. The derivation most often used during polysomnography is lead 2 as you can see here indicated by the red arrow going from the right upper chest to the left lower chest. P and QRS waves must be clearly seen in whatever derivation we use. Cardiac scoring rules in adults and older children consist of tachycardia implying heart rate over 90 sustained for a significant amount of time bradycardia implies heart rate less than 40 beats per minute assistly a cardiac pause of more than 3 seconds after 6 years of age White complex tachycardia should be diagnosed in the presence of three or more beats of a rate of more than 100 per minute with a long QRS duration. Narrow complex tachycardia should be diagnosed in the same situation as above but with a QRS duration of less than 120 milliseconds. Atrial fibrillation should be scored if irregular ventricular rhythm associated with P waves replaced by rapid variable oscillations. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. 
narrow complex tachycardia can be associated with obstructive sleep apnea, A true, B false. This frame shows sleep apnea linked to oxygenation drop. In conjunction, we can also see tachycardia of 110 bits per minute. Notice the thinness of the QRS complex corresponding to a narrow complex tachycardia. Such an event should be labeled tachycardia associated with a respiratory event. That is the presence of tachycardia associated with a respiratory event should be labeled as such. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Bradycardia can occur with ictal epileptiform activity. A true, B false. Bradycardia refers to a sustained heart rate below 40 beats per second. In the top panel, you can see epileptiform activity in the EEG tracings. And a little bit below, here indicated by the green color, you can see a, reg a fairly regular EKG rate that at the end begins to slow down somewhat. The heart rate in the lower panel shows significant bradycardia at the beginning and in the middle, and then the heart rate becomes stable and in the normal range. Notice that the clinical seizure started as indicated and at the time the heart rate was sustained. It was not until respirations became compromised that the heart rate dropped. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Score systole for cardiac pauses of more than 3 seconds after 6 years of age. In this frame, you can see the EEG tracing. You can also see blood pressure and heart rate being monitored. Relevant features are indicated. Notice the lack of heart rate that is assistedly lasting longer than three seconds at the bottom. Notice the drop in blood pressure pointed by the arrow and the time relation between the EEG changes and the asystole. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Alternating leg movement activation is a manifestation of REM sleep behavior disorder. A true be false. There is no one widely accepted classification of sleep-related movement disorders. An easy way to classify sleep-related syndrome disorder is by dividing them in two major groups, simple and complex movements. REM sleep behavior disorder, disorder of partial arousal, and epilepsy fall in the group of complex movement disorders during or around sleep. In the simple group, we have those that involve the jaw and face, among which we have bruxism and facial mandibular myoclonus, those that mainly involve the legs but may also affect the arms. In this group, we have periodic limb movements of sleep alone or in combination with restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome cannot be diagnosed by polysomnography because it consists of a bad sensation in the legs that can only be stopped by restlessly moving around, 
there comes the name of restless leg syndrome. In addition, in this group we have leg cramps, hypnagogic foot tremor, and alternating leg movement activation. Alternating leg movement activation is a benign condition not related to REM sleep behavior disorder. Also among simple movement disorder, we have those that can occur in children. And among those, we have benign sleep myoclonus and rhythmic movement disorders. The fourth group, that is where we put everything else, and that includes excessive fragmentary myoclonus and sleep starts or hypnic jerks. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following rules does not define a significant leg movement? A. Minimal duration, 0.5 seconds. Maximal duration, 10 seconds. C. Minimal increase of EMV activity above the baseline of 8 microvolts. D. Presence of an arousal. The term of significant leg movement is usually used to define a leg movement that should be counted to make the diagnosis of a series of leg movements consistent with the diagnosis of periodic leg movement of a sleep. Calibration of leg movements, asking the patient to do a specific activity with his or her legs prior to initiating the study should be done in all adults. Low frequency filter setting should be set at 10 Hz, high frequency filter setting at 100 Hz, sensitivity at 5 microvolts per millimeter, and the notch filter should be off when we do calibrations and throughout the polysonographic recording. The rules that define a significant leg movements are having a duration of at least 500 milliseconds but not being longer than 10 seconds and an amplitude of at least 8 microvolts above the EMG level. Significant leg movements may or may not be associated with arousal. Transient muscle activity between 100 and 500 milliseconds are common during REM and do not constitute an abnormality. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Please take a look at this frame and determine which leg movement of those above should be scored as a significant leg movement related to an arousal. A for A, B for B, C for B and C, and D O. Only A has the criteria to be labeled significant leg movement since it lasts more than 0 0.5 seconds. And the EMG increases more than 8 microvolts. B and C do not meet the duration criteria, although by looking at it, I am not too sure about C. Notice that A is associated with an arousal as reflected in the EEG channel and the Shin EMG channel. Remember that during REM, arousal have to be associated with an increase in Shin tone for at least one second. 
an arousal is not needed for the definition of a significant lift movement, but when an arousal or an apnea or hypoapnea occurs within 0.5 seconds of a leg movement, whether it is significant or not, it is considered related. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, which of the following should be labeled leg movement and arousal? A for A, B for B, C for A and B, D for none. EEG desynchronization is a sign of an arousal, but when it occurs earlier than 0.5 seconds of the beginning of a leg movement, it is not considered to be associated with the leg movement. The increase in chin EMG that you can appreciate in this frame occurring concomitantly with the leg movement does not qualify the event as an arousal since at the time the EEG is not consistent with an arousal. So A is not a leg movement arousal. In the case of B, a K-complex and EEG desynchronization occur simultaneously. To classify an arousal as leg movement related, the time between the arousal and the leg movement should not be more than 500 milliseconds which in the case of B, it is not. It is within the time span that can be called related to it. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, which should be labeled a leg movement and arousal? A for A, B for A and B, C for A and C, D for all. I have placed a green box to highlight the relation between adjoining leg movements and now a different green box on the arousals. As you can see, they are either within 500 milliseconds of each other or they are overlapping. Hence, the answer to this question is D. Next question. The timing of onset of a leg movement is defined as the point at which there is an increase of 8 microvolts EMG. The timing of the ending is defined as the start of a period lasting at least dash seconds with an EMG amplitude of less than dash microvolt. A 0.58, B 0.52, C 1, 2, D 1, 8. This epoch shows a left and right anterior tibialis movement. The issue is if they should be tabulated for the purpose of diagnosing periodic leg movement of a sleep as one leg movement or as two leg movements. Let's analyze this activity and apply to it the criteria that is being used for such a purpose. For the purpose of explaining if it is one or two leg movement, I have enlarged the figure by the side in the rectangle and label one on top A and the one in the bottom B. The time of onset only has a voltage criteria, which is an increase in amplitude of eight microvolts. The pale green arrow indicates a point at which this criteria is met in the A event and the cream color arrow in the B event. The end criteria has a time 
and an amplitude requirement. The time requirement is 0 0.5 seconds measured from the starting of a segment with EMB activity of less than 2 microvolts. That criteria is made in A and B at the location pointed by the arrows. Now I will go through the checklist to see if these movements meet the criteria to be labeled significant. And this criteria is the minimum duration, which is met in both events, the maximal duration criteria of 10 seconds is also met in both events, and the third criteria which states that the amplitude of the increase in EMG tone should be at least 8 microvolt is also met by both events. The oneness criteria, that is the criteria to make it one or two movements, dictates the following. If both events start within less than five seconds apart, they should be tabulated as one. That from the time of the ending of the longest event to the beginning of the next event be at least five seconds. Here the beginning of the next event is represented by the aqua arrow. Otherwise, the third event will be counted as being part of the initial significant leg event or movement. And the third criteria is that in order for a second leg movement, that is a movement in the opposite leg to be counted as being in the same series, the space between them should be less than 90 seconds. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. For the purpose of diagnosing periodic leg movement, two limb movements, one in each leg, count as one limb movement if they are less than dash seconds apart. A5 B10, C4, D8. I will use this frame to explain for the last time the difference between what is considered one or two significant leap movements for the purpose of being considered a series to diagnose periodic leg movements of a sleep. The two limb movements under the parentheses are considered one leg movement for the purpose of counting it as a series for periodic leg movement of a sleep. This is so because from the beginning of the first one to the beginning of the next one there is less than 5 seconds. The leg movement indicated by the arrow is also considered a single leg movement. Since it occurred more than five seconds from the beginning of the second movement of the first pair. So this frame shows two leg movements to be added to a series and not three. So the answer to this question is A. The minimum number of consecutive leg movement events needed to diagnose a periodic leg movement series is dash periodic leg movements A5, B10, C4, D8. This frame shows a periodic leg movement series. The series consists of a minimum of four consecutive significant leg movements. The minimum time interval between the leg movements is five seconds. If less, they should be counted as one, as we have previously mentioned so many times. 
the maximal period between leg movement to be count within a series is 90 seconds. So if a movement occurs after 90 seconds, then it should not be counted as part of the ongoing series. In this case, the duration between the leg movement was 15 seconds and therefore they can be counted as part of a series. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Leg movements that occurred within 0.5 seconds of a hypopnea or an apnea are not counted for the purpose of diagnosing periodic leg movement of a sleep. A true, B false. This epoch demonstrates a limp movement. This limb movement occurred in conjunction with an apnea resolution. When limb movements occur within 0.5 seconds of an apnea or a hypopnea, the movement should not be tabulated as an event for the diagnosis of periodic leg movement series. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Leg movements during a week can be counted as a movement to establish a periodic leg movement series. A true, B false. The conclusion that we are in the presence of a periodic leg movement series is achieved based on parameters we have already mentioned. A minimum of four consecutive leg movements within five seconds of each other and no further than 90 seconds apart. This frame represents seven leg movements, one during wakefulness, which is not to be counted for the tabulation of a periodic leg movement sleep series, thus leaving only six leg movements to be counted because the gap between leg movement 3 and leg movement 4 is less than 90 seconds, the criteria to diagnose periodic leg movement series is reached. I will give you a new example. This case is very similar to the anterior one, but here there are three wake epochs separating the sleep leg movements. Hence, since weak leg movements cannot be tabulated to diagnose periodic leg movements, and thus the interval between the beginning of the third episode and the beginning of the REM sleep leg movement is longer than 90 seconds, the criteria for periodic leg movement series is not reached. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Please take a few seconds to look at this frame and choose the correct answer. A. Periodic leg movements series. B. Alternating leg movement activation. C. Hypnagogic foot tremor. D. Excessive Fragmentary Myoclonus Alma, which in Spanish means soul, is considered a benign condition. The letters stand for A for alternating, L for leg, M for movement, and A for activation. It is diagnosed when a series of four or more leg movements alternate between the right and the left leg. In this frame, I have depicted eight leg movements. In this new frame, I am showing only four leg movements. The leg movements for the purpose of diagnosing AMA must have a duration between 
100 and 500 milliseconds. Thus, not long enough to be counted as a significant leg movement for the diagnosis of periodic leg movements. The interval between the beginning of two consecutive jerks should be between 500 milliseconds and 3 seconds. If they are closer than 500 milliseconds, they should be counted as one, as you can see in this example. If they are further than 3 seconds, they are not counted in the prior series. So ALMA, once again, is considered a benign condition. But at times, it is associated with arousal, and they tend to occur more frequently in patients taking antidepressant medication. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Please take a look at this frame and again decide what is the correct answer. The choices are A. Periodic leg movement series B. Alternating leg movement activation C. Hypnagogic foot tremor D. Excessive fragmentary myoclonus The characteristic of the leg movements consider periodic leg movements of a sleep consist of a series of four leg movements with an interval between them of 5 to 90 seconds and the burst of EMG lasting between 500 milliseconds and 10 minutes. This type of movements are pathological. Hypnagogic foot tremor has a frequency of 0.3 to 4 Hz, thus with an interval ranging from 0.25 milliseconds to 3.33 seconds. They last from 250 to 1000 milliseconds and they are benign. There is a very nice video in YouTube that you can see this type of movements. This is the typical appearance of hypnagogic foot tremor. Four or more than four are needed to establish the diagnosis. In this new frame, you can see the whole epoch as in the tracing associated with hypnagogic foot tremor. As you can see in this frame, it can affect only one leg, in this case the left, but in other situations or in other patients it may affect both legs. So the answer to this question is C. Remember that hypnagogic foot tremor is classified as a simple leg movement disorder but it, it is a benign condition most of the time. Next question. Please take a look at this frame and choose the correct answer. A. Periodic leg movement series. B. Excessive fragmentary myoclonus. Notice that the aqua arrow indicates that this activity goes on for more than 20 minutes during non-REM sleep. This epoch is an example of excessive fragmentary myoclonus. Excessive fragmentary myoclonus has three main features. As you can see in this frame, muscle activity is present in the left anterior tibialis muscle and the right anterior tibialis muscle. The EMG Correlate is usually, as you can see, very thin, but at times it may last a little bit longer. 
the usual duration of the burst of EMG is 150 milliseconds or less. But as we previously mentioned, sometimes it lasts a little bit longer, especially when they are visible. To diagnose this condition, the frequency of the EMG activity has to occur five times per minute or more. And the third feature is that it has to go on for over 20 minutes during non-REM sleep. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following is not a criteria for the diagnosis of excessive fragmentary myoclonus? A. The usual burst should be less than 150 milliseconds. B. Series of bursts must last for 20 minutes of non-REM sleep. C. Movements have to be visualized. D. Occurs with a frequency of at least 5 EMG potentials per minute. As we previously mentioned, the usual duration of the burst of EMG is 150 milliseconds or less. Most of the time, when this is the case, there's no noticeable movements. But at times, when they last longer, you can see them. That is, you can see the leg moving. This type of movements have to be present for over 20 minutes during non-REM sleep and they have to occur with a frequency of 5 or more per minute. So the answer to this question is C. Thank you very much for your attention.